Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, man, you're still asleep. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that's better. You know, we ought to sound like a bunch of teenagers because we are worshiping a God that is worthy of glory and honor. Amen? Man, that song, it just, it just brings tears to my eyes because we, uh, Isaiah said, as I am of, of a people of sinners and I have seen the glory of the Lord and how he was in fear that he would be destroyed because of just seeing the holiness of God. But we have that privilege as believers to come before his very throne and talk with him. What an honor. Well, this morning, I'm kind of continuing from last week. Uh, remember last week when I shared that, are we a church of small groups or a church with small groups? And I used the example of the BLT that when we go to that restaurant, they don't say, do you want bacon with that or you want lettuce or tomato? No. Well, I went out and experimented with that Sunday afternoon. And they did not ask me if I wanted, you know, bacon, lettuce, or tomato on it. But they did ask me, would you like potato salad with that? So are we a church with small groups? Are we a church of small groups? There is a distinct difference. Uh, this morning, kind of want to talk to you a little bit again in that small group, but the power of small groups. Here's a quote. Anybody recognize that name, this gentleman who uh, made this quote? Well, he writes, Some Christians try to do heaven alone in solitude, but believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. You know, they've got these wide areas. But, these, but those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect. They love to get together and sheep go in flocks. Can I get a bat over that? <laughs> All right, I know i got a bunch of sheep out there. But Jesus talks to that he is the good shepherd, and we are his flock. You know, and sometimes sheep are known for being stubborn, aren't they? You know, they, you're trying to push them this way, and they're going this way. Or you're trying to lead them that way, and they go that way. You know, we just have to trust in God. Uh, Small groups must be based on proper, and I'll tell you this, I do not speak Greek. Uh, one gentleman in my small group uh, asked me, well, what's this Greek word mean? I said, no, I don't know, it's all Greek to me. But this, <laughs> well, sometimes it's Aramaic, and sometimes it's Hebrew, but the word he asked me about was in Greek. And I got to get my Greek dictionary out, and I do my research and all that. But this word... And you want to, next slide, please. Comes back, authority. Power is God's authority. What did Jesus say before he ascended into heaven when he gave us the Great Commission? He said, all authority has, in heaven and in earth have been given to me. And then what did he do in turn? He gave that authority to the church. The authority to build on the foundation that he set. Uh, in Acts, when we look at small groups, we look at the beginning of the church and how it started. We know from reading that the day of Pentecost came upon them. Jesus told them, hey, go back to Jerusalem, wait for the coming of the other one. And we read in Acts that the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in many different languages and were understood in those languages. In fact, they were accused of being intoxicated so early in the morning. It, wouldn't that be something that you were so charged up with Jesus Christ that people say, what are you on? Hey, man, I'm on Jesus. 110% octane. Mm. Well, there is another Greek word that deals with power. And it's the Greek word from which we get the word dynamite. You know, explosive. Power that just, you know, awesome. And we see that expressed also in uh, Hebrews 11, uh, chapter, 24, uh, chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, when it says to encourage the other believers. It says, basically, you're putting a stick of dynamite 
in their seat to blow them out of their nice comfort zone. How many here need some dynamite to get you out of your comfort zone? Okay, I got a couple of honest people here. All right. I know I do. Sometimes I need it to get me out of bed in the morning. Uh, But when we start looking at power and small groups, is there kind of a contrast there? Do we usually associate those two words together? Small group and power? No, we generally look, okay, small is weak. You know, the movement was small, so it didn't count for anything. However, with God, numbers don't matter. Let's consider Gideon's army in Judges 7. How many remember Gideon? And okay, he says, God says, okay, you are now my judge. I'm sending you out to deliver Israel. He says, okay, but here's a couple of fleeces. Let's, let, I want to make sure you we're on the same page here, God. But what happens is, okay, let's go. About 32,000 men show up. All right, we got a good start here. God says, no. You go, what? He says, I want less, so that it will be obvious whose power this was done with. And so he starts breaking them up. In the end of the story, we know that 300 people, 300 troops, and they gave victory because it was through the power of God. Hmm. How about David and Goliath? About a nine-foot guy and a teenager? Not too fair, would you? Who would you bet on? Okay, okay. someone said God. Okay, you've read the story. But the odds were all in Goliath's faith because he was big, David was small. But God is powerful. Bethlehem, we just celebrated Christmas. Oh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem? That small little city? Why didn't he, you know, in the castle in Jerusalem? But uh, God chose Bethlehem, small. How about the feeding of the 5,000? Little boy walks up, five loaves, two fishes. Through the power of God, what happened? A miracle. Over 5,000 men, it says. But you start associating, associating wives and children. There was way more than 5,000 there, but they were fed because of the authority and power of God. And so when you put small groups and Christ together, you got power, you got authority, and that's exciting. Acts 2, verse 41 says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there was added to that day 3,000 souls. You know, Peter's out there, he's preaching, and the Holy Spirit convicts him. 3,000. Okay, leaders, small group leaders, what are you going to do with 3,000 people? Wouldn't it be a problem to deal with? Bring them to my house. Okay, I'm in trouble. Sharon, you have a real trouble. What did the early church do? What could they do? (laughs) We see in different scriptures throughout Acts how they dealt with that amazing growth. Uh, They didn't call them small groups. They didn't call them cell groups, life groups, or nothing like that. But what they did do was, it says... Okay, they met daily. They met daily. And where did they meet? In the temple courts. You know, a lot of times when we picture the temple, unless we really do research, we think, okay, big courtyard, the altar, the Holy of Holies. The temple was very, very large. There were many different courts. There was the court of the Gentiles, There was the court of the women. There were many different courts. And so they would meet in one of those courts in what we would kind of call today corporate worship. 
like what we're doing right now this morning. We have gathered together as a larger body to worship Jesus. And did we worship Jesus earlier this morning? Oh, some of those songs just touched your hearts. Thank you, Mike. Uh, but then they also met house to house. Interesting, isn't it? House to house. Not just my house, but spread out. The different believers' houses. Also, kind of historians put that 3,000 was just the starting point because it says, word says, and the Lord added daily to them. Daily. You know, they weren't bringing people from other churches. They were bringing people in that had came to the salvation, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The uh, historians believe that in the first 25 years of the Jerusalem church, they grew to about 50,000 people. 120 that were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost to 50,000 of the city. This was just before persecution broke out and scattered the church throughout the known world. You think there was a lot of comfortable people there at that time? You know, I didn't leave in Jerusalem. He said, what? I've got to go here, here, in the outermost parts of the earth? I want to, I'm comfortable. I want to stay here. But Jesus used persecution to spread his message. In the book of Acts, Luke is traditionally given the authorship of that book. But some say that, no, it was not Luke. But that doesn't really matter this morning. We know that it is the word of God. It gives us a glimpse into the first three decades of the church and its growth. And we have to be careful that we don't say, well, we've got to do church this way. No, because they were under some special circumstances at that time, too. Uh, the average house would fit maybe 30 people total. And that's putting them in the rafters and everywhere else, putting them on the wall with Velcro. Because they held things in common. And when I became a Christian, I'll use the example, if I was back in that day and I was a rich man, not, but if I was, I would have you know, some property, I would have some servants, slaves at that time maybe. Well, they would become Christians too. They became my brothers and sisters. We would worship together in the same home. If there was more room, I would invite brothers and sisters from the rest of the church, from the temple area. Hey, uh, you got somewhere you're going this afternoon? Okay, come over to my house. Well, how about this week? You come over to my place. We'll break bread together. We'll fellowship together. We'll pray together. And we'll study God's word. At that point, it was called the apostles' teaching. Yes, that's it. You've heard this before. Pastor John shared about it. Uh, the, again, the Greek word. This is where I you know, got a little ahead of myself there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking the bread, and prayer. Good. Uh, another Greek word was what's come to known as the church building today. The church. We call it the church. Okay, we, we're going down to the church worship. No, it was the people. Uh, Pre-church, it was considered a gathering of any group of people. Uh, it came later to know as the called out ones. Is that what Jesus has called us out? He's called us out from the world. Okay, what I'd like to focus now is on what I see are some key issues for small groups, the power of it. I look at five areas. And I kind of give you here is a circle. The top is fellowship, worship, discipleship, evangelism, and ministry. Uh, when I first got out of the military way, way back, I went to work at a service station. For most of you, you know what I say when a service station was a full service station. 
you know, you had a garage portion there. Uh, you'd change tires, mount tires, uh, do service lube jobs, pump gas. You don't see too many of those nowadays. However, one of the things that kind of came to me as I was studying for this was, think about it. Anyone ever watched a tire being mounted on a rim? Okay, a few of you. You get it on the rim, and then you put the air in it. And then the old style one was they'd drop the release, and they'd have a balancing part here. And you'd take little lead pieces. Yeah, okay, pop, pop, pop. Okay, not. I need to come over here now. And you'd level it out to make sure that it was perfect, or as perfect as you could get it. What would happen if I didn't do that balancing? And I put it on my car and started driving. Get some shimming. Uh, you'd get some bad wear on that tire. It would not be as useful as long as it should be. And our small groups can be the same thing if we get out of balance. And uh, remember last week I told you that one of my assignments was to evaluate the small groups at my former church. And it was interesting seeing how many were out of balance. Uh, some of the groups came together. Uh, service, they were really doing a lot of service, but there was no prayer. There was no Bible study, no discipleship or evangelism. They were focused on ministry. And one of the main ones was a group called the, the Gearheads. And I can kind of tell you what they were focused on. They were helping single ladies, uh, widows, on maintaining their cars. Great ministry, yes. But they lost the focus of what a small group was, that it has a well-rounded process. Let me ask you, when I put that air in that tire, you know, fill it up with air, 32 pounds, whatever it was, uh, was the air separated in any way in different points of the... No. Same thing with uh, small groups. It should be combined. There's parts in each section. Prayer, worship, ministering to each other. It's all part of that, I call it the tire, the well-rounded... Uh, life group. Other groups, very focused, Bible study only, but they had no ministry. They studied uh, discipleship, and I could not understand, okay, are you praying? No. Are you doing this? Then are you really being disciples? And so, you know, God has called us to evaluate ourselves, our ministries, according to his word. I would like to concentrate this morning on one particular area of the five, fellowship. If I asked you what does fellowship mean in your mind, what would you think? To take a moment, think about it. Fellowship. We have a fellowship hall downstairs, don't we? Is that where the only place fellowship takes place? Yeah. Again, it's that where do we fellowship? How it balances fellowship? Fellowship means, now let's go, worship, discipleship, evangelism, ministry. These are the five key areas I use to evaluate. Fellowship. Kononia. I've heard Mike talk about it to the worship team. What is kononia? You know, is it holding hands, singing kumbaya? <laughs> it can be. It's a small part of it. Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Is it part of eating together? It can be. But is it the total part of fellowship? Sitting around, talking with each other, small part of it. But kononia 
is used several different ways in the New Testament. Uh, and the translators in the research they did, they talk about, they use it in the context. And that's something that should really, we should understand. Many times we'll take a word out of context, we'll take a passage out of context, and we get a totally different meaning. It's a word we use too lightly in our churches. Much more than the informal getting together. It's coming alongside of someone, saying, and the word kind of gives the intent of carrying someone's burden, carrying someone's load. Was it Kurt who was talking that he was on that uh, trip one point and he was carrying that backpack and the guide was saying, let me take your pack from you. Let me take your pack from you. And he was stubborn. He said, I didn't give it to him for a long time. Well, that's what's kind of indicated in this first is that am I willing, am I carrying my brother's or sister's backpack for them when they cannot go any further? When they have, they're down on their knees and saying, God, I need help. Fellowship, coming alongside of them. You know, Konea has really no equivalent in the English language. That's one of the things when you can take Greek over to English, many times there's not a clear line to cover the same word. Like I said, Acts 2 focuses on the relationship between the believers. Second Corinthians in chapter 9, it uses another different type of koinia. And in this, it's talking about generosity, how generous the people are in taking up to help the others, other believers. So, okay, so fellowship is breaking bread with one another, spending time with one another. It's helping them with their burdens, and it's being generous. Because what do we see back in Acts 2? It says that when there was need, they did what? They gave. They gave. It says that they held things in common. They sold property. Doesn't mean that they gave up everything, but when a need came up, they dealt with it. And in that, we see one of the interesting side stories, which I, I think most of you have heard. They walk up, say, hey, I sold this property for X amount. No, you didn't. Why'd you lie to the Holy Spirit? Gone. I'll let you read that on your own. And then Paul talks about the fellowship with Christ in his troubles, in his life. A whole different kind of fellowship. Do we or are we willing to extend to that type of fellowship when it costs us, when it's painful? And that's what Paul is saying. Am I koinia so much that I want to be with you, alongside of you, in that pain and suffering. I know that, like I said, this kind of looks at me too. It's like, do I have enough love for my brother to have fellowship in that kind of uh, relationship? Let me ask you this. Is the Current life group, Bible study, whatever group you want to call it. This is kind of brutal. Is it a social daycare group? Or is it a small group of believers advancing the kingdom of God? And I've had to look at that myself, too. When I originally did this evaluation, was I leading a small group of daycare? Okay, we're making ourselves feel good, all the rest of this. Or are we advancing the kingdom of God? And I challenge you, each of you who are life group leaders, Bible group leaders, evaluate. 
Are you conducting a daycare center or are you advancing the kingdom of God? Because Paul said, I want to be part of that fellowship with Jesus and his suffering. A lot of difference between getting together for a nice little dinner conversation or serving alongside Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, is your group helping people move from isolation to connection? Are they new believers? Or maybe they're not even believers at all. Can your group help them move from isolation to connection? How many people out there in Twin Falls are looking for a connection of people who will care for them? Not out after something, but will care for them deeply. Are you moving them from loneliness to love? You will know, they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. Do you have that type of colonia? It's not easy to do that because you have to open yourself up to knowing them, but also knowing, letting them know you, taking those walls down. We all have hurts. We all have fears but we must bring those walls down. And again, we can only bring it down through the power of God, Jesus Christ. It's not easy to feel their hurts, but then on the other side, you can enjoy their joy. When they have victory, they come in and say, you know what? God has delivered me. Praise God that he has delivered me. We can share that. And how about, and this is what gets me going, is like, again, encouraging their hearts. Does it have to be something elaborate? No. It can maybe just a phone call, say, hey, I could say Mike, and then they don't know which Mike it is around here. But hey, Mike, you know, you know God just told me to give you a call. He said, you know, just, man, you're doing great. Appreciate a text, but encouraging their heart. Hey, I know you're having a battle. What can I do to help you? Encouragement. Those are some of the dangers. Those are some of the advantages of being in a well-balanced small group with fellowship. And just think, there's four more there to look at. So we got another couple hours to go, so I, I won't get them in. No, uh, I'm just thinking with fellowship this morning. <laughs> with these dangers, advantages of a small group, one of the things I gave you for de digging deeper is can you grow outside of a small group? Can you grow spiritually outside of that small group? Yes. But I want you in the deep, digging deeper. What are the challenges you will have? What are the disadvantages versus what are the positives of surrendering to that small group? Let me share some numbers with you. This, I always caution on uh, surveys because you never know, unless you really study what the surveys questions are, how many are in the study. Again, there's that kind of that power small. In a survey, if there's small numbers, not very powerful because your numbers are gonna be dealt in ways I, hate, I didn't like statistics. 
Uh, but if you have a large enough, it can give you some good information. This was conducted with over 3,000 churches throughout the United States. Uh, and this was dealing, nope, back up. I'll keep my hands down here. My remote was not working today, so. Uh, in, within the small group, if they were members of a regular small group attending on a regular basis, they found that 67% of group attenders read their Bible regularly versus only 27% of non-group members. That's quite a bit of difference, isn't it? What would you think that would make that happen? It could it be, hey, Mike, did you read your Bible this week? What did God, how did God speak to you this week? Could that be part of it? Yeah, it could be. Especially when a guy's like, man, he read three uh, chapters. I'm going to read six. <laughs> you know, the old fish was this big. But where does God teach us? In his word. And so this is showing that members of small groups are studying God's word more often than the non-attenders. Okay, here's an important one, prayer. Because who are we going before when we're praying? We're going before the very throne of God. And it says that 64% of regular group attenders pray for their church and or church leaders regularly. Only 30% of the non-group attenders did. Deacons, do you need the prayer? Oh, yeah. Need prayer, lots of it, please. Give me every bit of prayer you can give me. So 64% of their small group people were praying for their leaders, their pastor, their board of deacons, Sunday school teachers. How about our children leaders, our children teachers? So if they're praying for the leaders, who else are they praying for? Man, I want somebody praying for me constantly. I need it. Yeah. Someone help relieve Sharon. <laughs> Am I in trouble? <laughs> okay. And here's where it really meets the road. 82% of group attenders pray for fellow Christians versus 54% of non-group attenders. Small group uh, attendees here. And you can speak up, raise your hand, whatever. Do you appreciate it when someone prays for you? Jim, I Jim's over here. He's saying, yeah, I appreciate it all I give. Mike, you appreciate it. Well, I said Mike. Okay, you two are supposed to ask, also answer. <laughs> Amanda, do you appreciate when they're praying for you and your ministry? Huh. So what is keeping you from joining a small group for fellowship, for ministry, for discipleship. What is holding you back? 